What a what an awesome place to be tonight um, in the house of the Lord. Well, I want to read you a few verses. We're going to read uh, Deuteronomy, uh, the book of Deuteronomy, starting in chapter thirty-two and verse number fifteen. Deuteronomy thirty-two fifteen. Be good if I found my spot too. Okay, here we go. The scripture says, But Jeshuron waxed fat and kicked. Thou art waxen fat. Thou art grown thick. Thou art covered with fatness. Then he forsook God which made him and lightly esteemed the rock of his salvation. They provoked him, that is God, they, they provoked him to jealousy with what? With strange gods, with abominations, provoked they him to anger. They sacrificed unto devils, not to God, to gods whom they knew not, to new gods that came newly up. And by the way, just a, something to interject, there will always be new gods that come newly up. Meaning to say there will always be something new in our lives that tries to compete for the number one spot that only God, that only belongs to God in our life. That there's never a time when something new won't fight us for the lordship of our heart. So, to new gods that came newly up, whom your fathers feared not. Verse 18 says, of the rock that begat thee, thou art unmindful and hast forgotten God that formed thee. And when the Lord saw it, he abhorred them because of the provokings of his sons and of his daughters. And he said, I will hide my face from them. I will see what their end shall be. For they are a very froward generation. Children in whom is no faith. Now let's look over to verse 44. Same chapter, verse 44. And Moses came and spake all the words of this song in the ears of the people. He and Hosea, the son of Nun. And Moses made an end of speaking all these words to all Israel. And he said unto them, Set your hearts unto the Words which I testify among you this day, which ye shall command your children to observe to do. All the words of this law. For it is not a vain thing for you because it is your life. And through this thing ye shall prolong your days in the land, whither ye go over Jordan to possess it. Let's pray. Father, we love you, thank you, and praise you. I pray you'd honor your word tonight and help us as we teach and preach. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Thank you for standing. You can be seated. I thank you for joining us, everyone, at Fairview, Brother Tim and Miss Adrian, and everybody at, at our Fairview family. God bless you, and thank you for standing as well. I want to say two quick things before I dive in and begin to dissect this chapter. Number one, I want to uh, uh, tell you that a few months ago, myself and my daughter Sarah, who's on the front row and works with us in our ministry, and also Tim Klein uh, and William Griggs, we, uh, the four of us, jumped feet first into DMD, Disciples Making Disciples. 
I had not yet done that. Uh, I had not yet been involved in DMD. I had not yet um, done that. I had uh, basically made excuses as why not. You know, as with all of our excuses, I felt like a lot of mine were valid. And some of them were. I travel at different times of the year, weekly, to go preach at other places. I'm here, I'm there, I'm, I'm out of the country. I do a lot of things out of town. But finally, a few months ago, I got to the place where I said, you know what? I just believed in my heart that God was calling our ministry of Unsheltered International into a deeper understanding of how to make disciples, how to help people grow in the Word of God. And I told Tim, I told, well, I told our whole staff, I said, guys, we need to do this. And so we jumped in, and it has been the best thing that we have done for the spiritual health of our ministry in uh, it, probably ever, but certainly in a long, 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 long time. Tim Barbie is our um, trainer in our DMD class that we do. And I wanted to tell you that and let you know that I am now doing that. And I, uh, just simply as a commercial, to, and, and Preacher Malcolm didn't even pay me to, to say this. He don't know I'm saying it. But I want to encourage you to jump in if you haven't. DMD is not a program. It's a lifestyle that we learn to, to live as Christians so that we are doing our due diligence as obedient children of God to produce other people who will love God, love others, and serve both. So I want to encourage you uh, to do that. If you want more information on that, see me, message me, uh, see Brother Dustin, of course, Pastor Malcolm. Better yet, just directly Call the church office and uh, talk to them, and they know exactly who to give you. At Fairview, uh, see uh, Pastor Tim. And let's take the world, let's take the whole gospel to the whole world, amen, starting at home. So, um, and then the next thing I wanted to tell you was uh, just a quick update about our tiny home village that uh, we are building through Unsheltered International. God has blessed that. Um, uh, the project has taken... Uh, a long time seemingly uh, for two reasons. The biggest reason is we're raising the money as we go and paying cash for everything so that whenever the doors do open, praise God, we won't owe nobody. Amen? It's not like a, it's not a thing where we're seeking out government grants or we're taking loans from the bank. Um, God's people have been helping us pay for this. The roads in phase one are 99% complete. Um, the office pad is ready. We're just about to move our office there that was generously donated to us a couple, uh, well, about a year and a half ago now from a local business. Um, the, the house pads for the first three homes are finished, and we're, we're working every day on it. And God is blessing that ministry. The village at Unsheltered International is going to be a bright spot prayerfully in, in, in our community one day as we help people learn how to be disciples of Christ and put the pieces of their life back together. Amen. So thank you for praying for that. I haven't been able to update you lately, so I wanted to do that in person. Now I want to dive head first into what God was showing me this morning super, super, super early. I don't know if you're like me, but on Sundays and Wednesdays, it, God just bothers me with stuff that Pastor Malcolm says. And um, it's called conviction, by the way. And it's God, not, it ain't even Preacher Malcolm. But he was talking about how Jesus rose up a great while before day. I think he was preaching about that on Sunday. And so God put that on my heart Sunday morning whenever, uh, or Sunday night when I went to bed. The last thing I remember thinking when I dozed off to sleep, was a great while before day. And, and, and God let me wake up at 4.30 in the morning the next morning. I was like, well, praise God. And so got up with my Bible and fellowshipping with God. Then I decided, well, I'm just going to start setting my alarm for 4.30. And, um, and so uh, the Lord early this morning 
began to remind me of this message. I want to tell you a little bit about what's going on here in this chapter. This whole chapter, chapter 32 of Deuteronomy, basically, it is a song. A song. You could say like a psalm that God gave to Moses before the Israelites entered into the into Canaan or into the promised land. And God instructed Moses to teach the children of Israel this song so that they could teach it to their children so they could commit this to memory so that it would be a witness against them in the future when they would stray away again from God. So you can think of uh, chapter 32 as a song that God gave to the children of Israel through Moses, the, the, the leader at that time, to give them for both a warning and for a witness. Moses knew that Israel had a long history of turning away from the Lord and worshiping idols. And, and did they not? If you know anything about your Old Testament history, God delivered the children of Israel and they were like, woohoo, we're, we're, God's done this and we love God. And then the next day, they were turning their back on God. At, at Mount Sinai, they had made a, a golden calf and indulged in pagan sins. Then at a place called Kadesh Barnea, they wanted to appoint a new leader and return to Egypt. These were basically two big highlights or high spots of rebellion in their history. In both rebellions, it was intercession or the prayers of Moses that saved the nation from being destroyed completely by all of God's judgments. During their wilderness journey, the Jews had frequently complained to Moses about the way he was leading them. When the new generation arrived at the borders of Canaan, the promised land, the men indulged in immorality and gross idolatry with the women of Moab. And because of that, this is crazy, but God sent a plague that killed about 24,000 of the children of Israel. You can see that in Numbers 25. Israel's history obviously is a tragic, tragic story. And this is what you need to get tonight and what I need to remember it's a story of a people who were chosen by God to be His peculiar people. Much like those of us who are saved today have also been chosen by God to be His people. Here's the thing. Our story is often much the same. It parallels the story of the Israelites in the Old Testament. It's a life of struggles and sorrows. Why? Because we try to do life our way and on our terms. All too often we find ourselves living in a backslidden type of state. You find the word unmindful in verse 18. It says, Of the rock that begat thee, thou art unmindful. What does that mean? Well, it's the opposite, of course, of mindful. To be mindful of something means to be attentive. It means to regard that something or that someone with care. It means to bear in mind, to take heed, or simply to be observant, to be mindful. So unmindful literally means not 
mindful. Well, that's deep, isn't it? It means not attentive. It means to disregard, like to be unmindful of laws and unmindful of one's health or unmindful of one's duty. My mom and, and your mom growing up probably, and, and, and dad's probably said something like, uh, well, my mom said this I, to this day. She can't even tell me what it means. She say, mind your P's and Q's. I, I mean, I know what she meant. I don't know what a P is or a Q. I don't know. And maybe she knows and she's just never told me. But, but what she was saying is, you better be on your best behavior. You better be mindful that, I, that you're the kid, I'm the parent. Be mindful of these things. And so, so what's going on here is God has accused Israel, his children, of coming to a place in their, in their life collectively where they no longer regarded God as God in their life. They no longer were attentive to what God wanted, the direction God was leading, the outcomes God expected, and so on and so forth. He says, thou art unmindful. When it comes to God of the rock that begat thee, notice it's a capital R, the rock. In other words, when it comes to God, the rock that birthed thee, the rock that produced thee, the rock that has, has birthed you as a, as a people and brought you out of Egypt with a, with a high hand of him, now you've become unmindful. You, you come, maybe we understand it better. You've backslidden. You've forgotten The message can be summed up like this. Every one of us can be victorious over unmindfulness by learning the three elements of unmindfulness listed here. So I'm going to give you three different elements of unmindfulness and of course the subpoints and all that good stuff. Element number one, I want you to see the process of unmindfulness. How does this work? How does it play out? If you look back at verse 15, there's a weird name. The Bible says, but Jeshuron is waxed fat and kicked. Jeshuron waxed fat and kicked. Most scholars agree that Jeshuron is like a nickname for the children of Israel here. So when it says Jeshuron, it's speaking particularly particularly of the children of Israel. But here's, here's the, the really neat thing about this. The actual name, Jeshuron, it means honest. It means upright. It means righteous. And so he says, but Jeshuron is waxed fat and kicked. I believe... That, that God was saying by calling them Jeshuron, I believe God is saying, this is who you're supposed to be. Righteous, upright, holy, mindful. But this is who you've really become. Unholy, unmindful, chasing idols, and so on and so forth. So the name Jeshuron, it's like a nickname for the children of Israel. And God used it to point out what he desired for them to be, but what they had actually wound up being. And how many of you know this? Sometimes we find ourselves actually being what God didn't necessarily intend on us to be. Boy, I've been there before. And if you live long enough, long enough as a Christian, you'll probably be there too. Well, how did this process of becoming unmindful play out? How did it unfold? How did it happen? Well, I think like anything else in life, 
It didn't happen overnight. It didn't happen because they quote unquote missed one church service. It was obviously a process. Chapter 30 and verse 17 sheds a lot of light into this process. I'm going to read it to you. But if thine heart turn away, so that thou wilt not hear, but shalt be drawn away and worship other gods and serve them. Listen. The process of mindfulness, A, their heart began to turn. Their hearts began to turn. Verse 17 says, but if thine heart turn away. Understand this. Everything that Satan is doing in the the system of the world, in the economy of what the Bible calls the world system, everything is intended for deception, for uh, imitation. In other words, Satan wants to imitate God. It's like a bait and switch. And it's all done with the the desire from, from Satan himself to turn the hearts of God's people away from God and toward anything else. You see, Satan understands you don't have to be in a satanic temple worshiping at Satan's actual altar to be opposed to God. What do we have to do? We simply have to have our hearts stolen away by anything else and turned from God. Why is that so bad? Because then our heart is no longer tuned in to God. Our heart is no longer surrendered to God. Our heart is no longer in in pace with God and everything in the Christian's life stems and flows from the seat of our emotion, our heart and soul. And if anything else gets our heart besides God, it's a downward spiral. It's a downward course. It's a path of destruction, if you will. So their heart began to turn. Then B, their ears ceased to hear. Their ears ceased to hear. Isn't it true that we can know when someone wants to hear something from us? They listen. Don't you love those people? And and I bet you as I describe this person, they're few and far between, but you know somebody. That person who when you talk to them, generally they're not like on their phone and, huh? You know those people, that, that's par for the course, right? But you know those people that whenever you get in a conversation with them, they're just, uh-huh, and they, they listen? It's because they're tuned into you. They want to listen. Why? Their heart's in the conversation. April and I have a friend, a a, a family friend over in uh, Appling, Georgia. The first real person, well, I mean, there was others, but the first real lady that just really captured my attention as far as a a gracious southern woman that would pay you attention, Miss Pollard. Mrs. Pollard, a very wealthy lady, mother, grandmother. Um, I'm good friends with her son. And it doesn't matter if you're worth a billion dollars or if you don't have two pennies to rub together. If, you, if she gets in a conversation with you, the whole world's blocked out. And you have her ear. And it's so convicting when I talk to her because it's like, oh, dear God, I'm supposed to be like that. I'm supposed to pay attention to people, and I, I usually don't. Well... What happened with the children of Israel is their heart began to turn 
And then they began to, their ears began to close. In other words, there was a time when they heard from Moses, who had heard from God, they were attentive to, to God, and they were willing to hear. But you know what happens when something, when our heart's stolen away from a subject matter, all of a sudden we start to tune it out. If I had to guess, I would guess there's somebody here tonight. God used to have your attention. You used to read and even ask God through prayer to speak to your heart. But here lately, it's been the motions. And you don't even really realize it, but you hadn't heard from God in a while, and it's because you have ceased to hear. You've stopped your ears. That's what happened with the children of Israel. And then see, their loyalty began to shift. Deuteronomy 30, 17, it says, but shall be drawn away. So their heart was turned away. They began to stop their ears and they were drawn away. In other words, the loyalty that they once had for God had began to shift toward any and everything else. And that led to, to D, their activity began to change. In verse 17, the last thing is it says they worshipped other gods and served them. Here's what I want you to understand before we move forward from this point. They didn't start day one of their unmindfulness by worshipping and serving other gods. There was a process that got them to that point to where their daily activity was worshiping and serving other gods. That's why all the little things are so vital. When I'm helping somebody train their dog, the person, and you know, I get it, I get it. The person's like, I just want my dog to be still. I just want him not to tear my leg off. I just want him not to kill the FedEx and the UPS man again. And then I get involved as a dog trainer and I'm like, okay, if we don't want no more casualties from the delivery guy, here's what we need to do. We need to crate train him. We need to put a leash on him. If he's never not in the crate, he has to have a leash on. And then we got to do this exercise called sit on the dog. And we, it's a calming. And, and then I go through about 20 things. And it never fails. Maybe a couple times, but it never fails. You can just see people. Ah, this is stupid. What's a, what's a kennel and a collar and a leash have to do with biting the UPS man. They just want the finished product of a good dog. But as a professional, I know that the finished product is made up of many what seems to be microscopic behavioral aspects. When you put all them in place and have consistency, your chances are getting this good product of a well-behaved dog. So you can't have the well-behaved dog without all the pieces and, and products or pieces in place. And so that's what happened with them. Nobody in here tonight is sitting here thinking, I'll tell you what, by this time next year, I'm going to worship idols. <laughs> by this time next year, I'm going to have a house on the lake and every Saturday night I'm going to go out there and I'm going to learn how to water ski and, and every Sunday morning I'm going to water ski and I don't care about Brother Malcolm no more. That's not how that process goes. Well, how does it go? It's a slow process. It's a turning of the heart, a stopping of the ears. And finally our loyalty is gone until finally... Our whole life, we're unmindful of the things of God. And nobody can tell us any different. Now, let's move to number two. Let's look at the problem with unmindfulness. 
Now, you might think, well, duh, obviously it's a problem. God don't like it. And I'd agree with that. But there's more to it than that. And I want to dive into something here, and, and, and I think I can help you in this point and the next point. The problem with unmindfulness. Let's jump right into A. God's face is hidden. Problem number one, God's face is hidden. So look at verse 20, if you will. Uh, chapter 32, verse 20. And he said, I will hide my face from them. Now let's get this straight. This is God. God said, because Israel is waxing fat. And by the way, waxing fat it means to backslide. It means to become complacent. It means, to, it means that God blessed them so good and, and, and did so much for them that they just got to that place where they were like, hey, hey, life is good. Don't need God no more. And then they went through that whole process. That's literally what that means. And so God says, because of that, because you've went through this process and I've tried to call you back, because of that, I'm going to hide my face from you. That's not really terminology that we would use in our regular everyday vernacular today. So I want to tell you a little bit about what it means when it says that God's face is hidden. The pulpit commentary said, God himself, about God's face hidden, it says that God himself comes forth to announce his resolution to withdraw his favor from them and to inflict chastisement upon them. He'd with, he would withdraw his protecting care of them and see how they would fare without it. And he would also send on them the tokens of his displeasure. Now let me set this up. There's people in this room tonight. When it comes to uh, difficulty in our life and um, um, problems and, 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 and just all kinds of issues, there's not a one-size-fits-all uh, description of that, right? We know that sometimes life just happens. It ain't nobody's fault. Sometimes we go through stuff and it ain't because you did nothing. You know, it, listen, it, it, if your washing machine broke down, the devil didn't necessarily do it. It could have been that drunk dude at GE that was drunk that day. It built. I, he built it. I don't know. It could just be that plastic parts, they don't make them like they used to. It very well could be the prince of the power of the air. He could be fighting against you and he could, send a, he could have sent a demon to attack it. Every preacher in America will tell you he does that to sound systems in churches. <laughs> so sometimes life just happens and our problems are because of life. Sometimes... Like in this story, we find ourselves deep in a pile of mess and it's the chastising hand of God. But know this. It says clearly here, they were being chastised of God. But here's a point I want to bring out. Even their chastisement, it was from God but it was not God's fault. Watch this. It's very important to note here that the problem was not God. Deuteronomy 32 verses 4 and 5. Watch this. It says, He is the rock. This is talking about God. He is the rock. His work is perfect. For all His ways are judgment. A God of truth and without iniquity. 
Just and right is he. They have corrupted themselves. Can I say that again? They have corrupted themselves. Their spot is not the spot of his children. They are a perverse and crooked generation. So let's break that down. God was their rock. His works were perfect. Uh, He was a God of truth with no iniquity. He was just and he was right. You following me? There was nothing wrong with God. They had turned away. They had went through this sinful process because of their sin nature. They had corrupted themselves and now life was a struggle. You following me? So they got to this place of unmindfulness and God said, you're my people. I'm not happy to just, I'm your God. I can't just let you go that way. I have to do whatever it takes to prove to you it's better with me. And so God began to chastise them. In other words, God allowed trouble to come into their life. God's face being hidden is pretty much God stepping back and saying, go ahead. Have at it. Can I tell you something? I don't ever, I don't want to live one hour in this world with God having to say to me, have at it, son. Because when God hides his face through chastisement, it's almost like you could say it this way, you are a sitting duck. I, for one, want the anointing of God on my life. I, for one, want the protecting hand of a gracious heavenly Father on my life. I, for one, want to look toward God, and I sure want God looking toward me. I need to fling myself on the mercies of God day in and day out because I have had a taste of what I can produce as far as goodness. And it ain't good. So problem number one is God's face is hidden. And it's a big issue because here's what happens. We misdiagnose our lives, don't we? People come to to, to me every week. Come to our our, our ministry every week. And, And they're mad at their ex. They're mad at their family. They're mad at their employer. They're mad at their dog and cat. And every problem in their life is the fault and result of everybody except themselves. And it's a vicious cycle of blame. And it's like no matter what I say, it just, the mirror I hold up don't work. You see, that's why people have such a great opportunity to change when they give their heart to God. I'm going to tell you this. Before I gave my heart to Christ on August the 1st of 1994, I was a lot like that. It wasn't my fault. I, I, you know, in my mind, it, hey, it, it. But then when I came to God and like Pastor Malcolm said, began to uh, be empowered by the Spirit, to humble myself and all that, then I began to see, oh, I'm my own worst enemy. God, I need you. So the first problem here is God's face is hidden, which produces chastisement and produces all these life issues. Then the second problem is our faith is hindered. Verse 20 says, For they are a very froward, this is not forward, froward, F-R-O-W-A-R-D. They are a very froward generation. Children in whom is no faith. Froward means perverse. It means turning from. 
with an aversion or reluctance. And you can see the, the definition there. It, it, if to be froward literally means to be a person that ain't got time for God. That can do it my own way. I'll figure this out myself. A very froward generation. And boy, are we raising a generation like that today. This morning, a verse hit me like a ton of bricks. And it's verse 6. Chapter 32 and verse 6. And I'm telling you, this one hurt. Verse 5 says, uh, they've corrupted themselves. Their spot is not uh, the spot of their, his children. They are a perverse and crooked generation. Then in verse 6 it says, do ye thus requite the Lord? I bet I've re rehearsed that every hour on the hour today during my whole day. Do ye thus requite the Lord? The word requite means to, basically means to repay. It especially has this meaning of to repay evil for good or to repay good with evil. Do ye thus requite the Lord? In other words, God's saying to them, I've been so good to you. And yet you've been so evil to me. God's saying, is this how you're going to treat me? Boy, doesn't that, if you love God, that breaks your heart. I know nothing hurts my heart more than when I know that I have failed God. What hurts my heart? Let me explain this another way. The whole nation seemed to watch a couple weeks ago as a young lady named Carly Russell and her story unfolded down in Hoover. Is that where it was? Hoover? Um... First day or two, especially those of us around here, we were all like fighting mad because of what someone had abducted her and how it played out. And it was just, we were the police department, the, 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 everybody that on social media, we were so mad because our world was so corrupt and this happened to this precious young lady. And especially how they use the child to, to bait. And that stuff really happens. And we all know it really happens. And so we were mad. But then as the story began to unfold, our anger and the nation's anger turned, right? We learned that basically it was all a hoax. There was no toddler on the side of the road. There was no emergency. There was no abduction. There was no kidnapping. There was no being held and all this stuff. And uh, social media and, and the news, rightly so, just went berserk in the other direction. The Hoover Police Department rightly has brought forth these charges in their, their Class A misdemeanors. Is that right? And everybody in, in social media land is like, Really? Is that all? She cost uh, the, 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 the different law enforcement entities millions, untold millions probably in resources and time and effort. My mom used to talk to me about the little boy that cried wolf. Right? I don't know if that's a thing anymore, but it was when I was a kid. You know, don't play around, son. One day you're really going to be drowning in that pond out back and I won't, I'll think you're playing and you'll be at the bottom of the lake, you know. Well, here, here, here's why, why we're all so upset with that, basically. Because human trafficking really does happen, right? There really are victims. There really are toddlers that are victimized to, to be bait. It really happens. There really are young women that are, that are abducted and then sold and, and, and all this awful, awful, awful stuff. It's a, real, it's a reality in life. And so here we found out that, that this young girl had a, a home, a job, a family, and, 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 and she fabricated all this. It's like she wasn't really that way. She, 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 she just fabricated all, but she was safe, but then she made this up. 
And so we were mad. But can I hold the mirror up for just a moment? And don't fuss at me because this is what God told me to write down. God gave you clean lungs. Yet you fill them with toxic smoke daily. God gave you a clear mind. Yet you continue to fill it with filth. God gave you a good brain. Yet you continue to fry it with illegal and in some instances legal drugs. God gave a good liver. Yet you insist on destroying it with poisonous alcohol. God gives us working feet and legs, yet we use them to run swiftly to evil. God gives us eyes that see, yet we use them to look at pornography. God gives us air to breathe, yet we use it to further our life of rejecting God and His goodness. You see, when it's Carly Russell who everything was going good and then she, she did this, it's awful. But what about when it's me? What about when it's you? It's harder to point the finger at yourself, isn't it? Everything, was, now, now listen, we don't know what was going on in Carly's life, mind. I don't know. I don't know that. I don't know what demons torment her. I don't know. So hear me. I don't know. But I do know she had a house to live in. She had a family. She had all that. But yet she did all this. And you're all mad. I don't know what's going on in your life. But I know what God started you out with. And I know what sometimes we do with it. Why are you not mad at yourself? And some of you are. Sometimes I am. But sometimes we go on unmindful in the problem that it, we've created for ourselves. See what I mean? So God's, God, God, God's face is hidden. Our faith is hindered. If you're here tonight and you're like, why well, just don't believe anymore? Why is it you don't believe? Is it because God's not good? Or is it because you've got yourself so far down this dark hole of your own doing that, that your faith has been hindered of your own will? Number three, our future is hampered. Verse 29 says this of 32, 32, 29. Oh, that they were wise, that they understood this, that they would consider their latter end. God said, if you would just stop and consider what's going to happen in the end. And I think sometimes God says that to me. Travis, if you just stop long enough to consider where this road's going to lead you, you wouldn't want to be going down it tonight. Let me give you the last one, number three, the prescription for unmindfulness. Thank God that God tells us what's wrong and how to fix it. Amen. Thank God for that. The prescription for unmindfulness. Let's look to verse 46. Chapter 32, verse 46. We read these in, in the beginning. And he said unto them, Set your hearts unto all the words which I testify among you this day, which ye shall command your children to observe to do. All the words of this law, for it is not a vain thing for you because it is your life. A, set your heart. Set your heart. He said unto them, set your hearts unto all the words which I testify among you this day. In other words, Moses says, look, all this that I have testified to you about today, here's what you need to do with it. Thank you. Here's what you need to do with it. You need to take and set your heart to it. 
Preacher Brown said something one time that stuck with me forever. He preached a whole sermon on it. He said the, the heart of the problem is, is a problem of the heart. And listen, as much as I hate to say it, the problem in all these things, that, that all these things are actually even true. The problem is not the economy. The problem is not low wages or high wages. The problem is not the lack of anything. Some of those things play a big role in certain areas, like I, I will tell you that, and I do believe that. The problem is not who you're married to. The problem is not who your kids are. The problem is not your social status. The problem is the heart. If you think that God is so small that He can't bless you in spite of who you're married to, you got the wrong God. If you think that God is so small that He can't provide for you in spite of the economy, you've got the wrong God. We had a fundraiser this past week. And all week I was worried because I thought we didn't have enough people. And I thought, man, the economy's different this year than it was last year. Boy, was I wrong. Are all them things true? Yeah, we didn't. We got a much bigger building, but the crowd wasn't no bigger. Is the economy worse this year than last year? I think it really is. Like legitimately, it is. There's problems. But have you ever noticed that God oper operates on a different economy? He, he's self-sufficient. He's altogether lovely. You're the apple of His eye. And He can provide for you. And so what, what God says is, when you realize that, hey, this is you. You, 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 you've not been thinking much. You, you've, you've had God out of your mind. You, you found yourself just barely treading water, trying to come up for air and about to drown for the final time. God says, here's what you do. Set your heart. In other words, repent. Turn back to God. And there's a million promises in the Bible that tell us that God will hear. The, the scripture says in James, uh, draw nigh unto God, and He will draw nigh unto you. The scripture says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. The scripture says in Proverbs 23, My son, give me thine heart. The prodigal son set his heart and he found a father with open arms. Amen? Amen. I'm sitting here, I'm trying to tell you tonight, no matter how deep the hole is, no matter how far down you are, you can either die there or you can repent and set your heart and you can once again feel the loving arms of God, your heavenly Father, around you. Yeah. And boy, what a feeling it is. B, not only set your heart, but, but B, seize your life. Verse 47 says, and I love the, I just love the way it's worded here. For it is not a vain thing for you. Why? Because it is your life. It's your life. Can, can, can I put it this way, maybe? It's your life. Yeah. Yeah. William, it's your life. It, your life ain't mine, and mine ain't yours. I can't. I, I can't live your life for you. It, it just don't work that way. It's not my responsibility. It is yours. Uh, Brother, Brother, Brother Mickle, I can't live your life for you, and you, so you can't live my life for me. Now, I can pray for you, but I can't pray for you. I can pray f on your behalf, but I can't take your place of praying for you. Are y'all with me? It's your life. Nobody. Listen, I tell uh, the folks in our ministry, I tell them this a lot of times. Sometimes, Tim, listen to me. David, listen. This is, this is good. I think we can all probably testify this. But Tim, sometimes you know as well as I do, 
we hit roadblocks when we're trying to help certain people sometimes. It's like a brick wall. And, and, and we'll have meetings and we'll just be like, how do we help? How do, what do we do now? And nothing comes to us. We can't think of no way around it. Am I right, Tara? You know why that typically is? It's not because we're dumb. It's not because we ain't done this for dozens of years. Let me give you a secret. It's because nobody else is supposed to do it for the only one that can do it. Are you with me? In other words, God, God said this. God basically said, hey, it, 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 if a man don't work, neither should he eat. You realize that's in the scripture? Yeah. If a man doesn't work, neither should he eat. In other words, what that means is, if someone's capable of putting forth effort to go to work every day and, and feed themselves and their family, then they should be the ones to do it. Now, if someone has a handicap and, 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 and they're not capable or whatever, that's not what that means, right? But as far as God's concerned, if you're able, but you're unwilling, the ministry of hunger needs to minister to you. And don't we love to say that when it comes to other people? But what about your life? I can't live your life for you. Preacher Malcolm can't. Pastor Andrew can't. Your wife can't, your, your, your spouse can't, your friends can't. But here's what God says. God says in verse 47, For it's not a vain thing for you because, listen, it's your life. When I read this, God said, Travis, it's your life. It's your responsibility. Nobody can be mindful to God on your behalf except you. And let me give you a little pointer. If you'll be mindful of God while you have the faculties of your mind, God will make sure that someone is mindful of you when you no longer have the faculties of your mind. Yes. 